Yeah. It is a little yeah. blown out, but it total, it's not that bad. It's okay. It, it's, um, yeah, it seemed, it, it, it looks like what my webcam looked for six months. Do you remember, you actually remember oh. this, Kate? You remember how I was an apparition just floating yeah. over? It was amazing. Yeah. How could I forget? Yeah. It is Tuesday, April 27th, 5.01 p.m. We are right on time, but we would be remiss if not to mention that we are without Ben Wittes for the first time in, I think, Ben, or Scott, is this our first show together? Yes, this is our first show Whoa, together. Wow, in yeah. 309, yeah. well... He missed a few and I had to solo host, but in 395 episodes and we're like, this is the worst burn. You don't know this, Michael, but like Ben is obsessed with the brood X and has been like completely like oh, no. wanting to like, to like, he just keeps like talking about how fat the birds get and how they just waddle around like drunk on cicadas. And so like he has been died. So he's like super FOMO to be missing this show today. Um, but we are very lucky to to be here. I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Michael. How do you pronounce your last name? Uh, exactly how it looks. Uh, just Skavarla? Skavarla. 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 Okay. Yep. That's Skavarla. A, that's not, Skavarla. Skav that, that's a bit rural juror ish. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm not, never. I mean, it's a, it's a bit. It's a bit. Um, but I, I was first of all. I really. I'm so. Um, thrilled that you 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 answered our our, uh, <laughs> our my, my, uh, my plaintive plea. That's just so so nice of you to. Um, and also, I know your professor. It's at the end of the semester. You were actually in a faculty meeting. I was um, in a faculty meeting. Right. Um, um, <laughs> uh, and um, so th so thank you so much. But I just can we before we talk about cicadas? Okay. Mm -hmm. I really want to know what an uh, what a what an insect ID lab is because sure. um, it, that really sounds shady to me. It really sounds like a CIA front thing that you're developing some bioweapons or something. But so in your in your Twitter bio, bio it does say, right, that you yeah. work for an insect ID lab. So please tell us. Yeah. So we want, to, well, but first also, Michael, you should give everyone the kind of the, the what you were kind of telling me about how your professorship works at Penn State um, and, um, like and running a lab and everything else, including that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I run the insect identification lab at Penn State. Um, you didn't get that from my bio because I didn't put it there. Uh, but yeah. So I my appointment is 100% extension. I don't have any teaching or research appointment. Uh, so at land grant colleges in the U.S., they've got a three part mission: uh, teaching, which is obvious, you teach students. Research, which is also fairly obvious, you do research that you know uh, advances human knowledge in some way, uh, and then extension, which a lot of people aren't familiar with, which is translating that research that is done on campus or at field stations in ways that the general public can digest and understand. So we're taking that research and that teaching and, and getting it out to people, uh, like I'm doing right now. So this would be oh, extension. That, oh, I see. So this is great. So. This is like part of what your core responsibilities are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I typically also. handle all of the uh, like journalist requests for the department if they've got questions about anything for an interview or whatever. So I've actually been talking a lot about brood 10 cicadas uh, for the last couple months. And when in your, in your other job, you just like, you run like a small DMV for insects. In yeah. which you just print these tiny little. <laughs> <laughs> so as part of that extension, my like the focus of my job in my lab is insect identification. So any insects that come into the department from the public writ large, it's my mandate is for Pennsylvania residents because we're at Penn State. But really, it is anybody that sends anything in from anywhere because it. I just do it. Um, anything that comes in that the public wants to say, like, what is this bug? It's eating my plants. It's eating my crops. It's biting me. It's in my house. It. I'm curious about what it is. That's a um, job. Yeah. No. no, no, no I, oh, cool. <laughs> that that is that is really really cool. Okay, I have I mean, a love here. But it is from your pet. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think that there's a mistake. 
it, it's in your Twitter bio. It is. It Does says it you're a director of the ID Lab. Do you know what that is? Yeah. Uh, it's one of the swallowtail species. Yeah, it's a swallowtail butterfly. Um, so, so that group is really cool. In the eastern U.S., there are mm, three or four species that all mimic each other that have that general black with metallic <laughs> patterns. There's only one that is like they're toxic. very different in Texas. Yeah, well, so there's one that's toxic and distasteful to birds, and all the other ones mimic it. But sometimes it's only females. Oh, um, I. I think, I haven't thought about it since last summer when people sent me some, that might have been a spice bush swallowtail, but I'd have to check. Um, cool. There's a really cool, cool mimicry complex that occurs mostly in the eastern U.S. Uh, there's other swallowtails like out west. Super cool. <laughs> what, 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 what was the, like, what was the stupidest thing anybody asked you to identify? Like, did they, like... Give you like a bottle cap or something, and say wood insect or something. Is this like what was it like the a cat or something? Was there something that just like just like a piece of toast? Cat bug. Yeah, I don't know if I'd say stupid per se because people like they they have genuine concerns. They just don't know what it is. I I do get inorganic material a lot. Like people find dirt and they worry it's some kind of bug on their floor. Um, I think the. The coolest one I got. Uh, we're not. We are. We are not. We're not appreciating how funny that is. I know that so, is like really funny. They just like send you a box of dirt, and you're like, "This isn't a bug." It happens fairly uh, often enough. Um, or people will get like a little piece of leaf or something. They'll worry because especially, especially with older clients that don't like maybe their eyesight's starting to go. Like they see a thing and it's not supposed to be there and they can't really tell what it is or like a little ball of lint. And okay, now you're making me feel bad at laughing at old people, but that was fun for a second there. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to rain on your parade. Did, did, you, did you, one last question to, about this from my end, but like, cause I, I have to say like your job sounds like objectively super fun. Was this something you always wanted to do? Because I could see always wanting to do this. But if you always wanted to do this, it'd be, this is really awesome that you got to do it. Um, I've always liked insects. Like I knew from like age seven, I wanted to be an entomologist and work on insects somehow. But that was, I'll show my age a little bit. That was pre-internet. So I didn't really have resources to, to know like what an entomologist did. Uh, so I just decided to go to school for entomology and figure it out from there. Uh, and it turns out I got into my first insect taxonomy class, which is like what in what insects are and how to ID them. It was really good at it and didn't like I, I, I was like, why is everybody else struggling? This is so easy. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is great. It's yeah. like, this yeah, is so interesting. Yeah. Just, this like, is, just are... like just IDing them like you were really good mm -hmm. at IDing them. Yeah. Like so <laughs> I, I liken it to a car person that is really into like classic cars and can just see something driving down the road and be like, just by the taillights, like, oh yeah, that's a 50, I don't know, 76 Camaro or something. And I look at so, muscle cars and they all look the same. Right. Sorry, car people, but they, I don't, I don't get it. I can't tell them apart. Um, so I get it because I can't do that with cars. So I get why people have trouble with things that I like. Yeah, I am. I, um, I, 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 Kate, do you have yeah. a corresponding skill? Because I don't have, like, there's almost nothing that I can see, and therefore You know about the skill. My skills are basically injuring myself. And then also, um, and then also, I'm, I have, like, a weird druidish nature of, like, finding hurt animals or, like, hurt animals, like, finding me. And that's, like, very strange and has, like, I don't know if I've had that ever since, also since I was, like, a little kid kind of like you with like bugs. Like I just like <laughs> get along with animals very well. Um, but no, but nothing like identifying something like that. That's really wild. Um, I, so, I should say, sorry, I got real lucky with no, 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 this go ahead. job. There's like maybe half a dozen insect ID labs across the country. There's one at Cornell and one at Ohio State, typically at like land grant universities, the, the state school. Uh, this job just happened to come open when I was looking for jobs and I just happened to get it. So it's not like there's a lot of us and I could have planned for it. I, I just got super lucky with the timing. Um, so I'm really curious when you have like, 
so the uh, the one thing that I am thinking that people must ask you to ID a lot is ticks. Yes. Um, does, is that something you end up IDing a lot, like different types of ticks and whether or not, and do you do the testing on them to determine if they have Lyme disease or is that like not your, not your pay grade? That's a can of worms. Um, okay. Yes and no. So, yeah, I, so, I, I knew not, I just want to say, Michael, yeah. I knew not to go there. Um, <laughs> really? you know, actually, I, 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 I knew that that like, you just don't bring up Lyme disease. You just don't, but well, you did, so whatever. Yeah, so I do get a lot of ticks. We're at, so in Pennsylvania is the hot spot of the country for black-legged ticks and Lyme disease. We've got any anywhere from 30 to 60% of the black-legged ticks in this area test positive for Lyme. Uh, which means if you get bitten in, the vast majority of ticks that people ratio. encounter here are black-legged ticks. So if you get bitten by a tick in Pennsylvania, chances are you could get Lyme. Uh, we don't test for it because my lab doesn't have that capacity, but there is a lab at East Stroudsburg University that does, and it's free for Pennsylvania residents because it's such a problem here that the state legislature like gave them a hundred thousand dollar grant or something to do the testing. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's nice to see some support from the state. Um, cause yeah. it is, it's, it's a totally. huge problem here. Yeah. Um, so okay. Can we so, move to cicadas? Because I mean, I'm basically, that's why you were brought on. Yeah. Um, no. I'm, and let's just I'm, let me I'm just, just be you guys questions. I could go all night. Yeah. No. No. I know. Oh but I mean, that that that's why you're getting dinner. Um, so can you can you t I mean, first of all, it's brood ten, not brood X. Yeah. They're so the periodical cicada broods are numbered by Roman numerals. So it just happens that Brood 10, which looks badass because it's Brood X, uh, it's just coincidence. It could have been like Brood 7 and be, uh, what, VII and look dumb. Uh, but it is Brood 10 because it's a Roman numeral. I, I, I see. Okay. So it, I, like, it, to me, it sounded a bit like Gen X. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now, here's the thing, which is, I, I, so, you know, so, why are they called cicadas? Oh, why are they called cicadas? I mean, you investigate the origin of words. I would expect. I uh, I know this, but only because I went to Wikipedia before I came here. Uh, I, I didn't that. know this five hours ago. So it turns out cicada, <laughs> it, cicada in Latin is the name for them because they, they occur in the old world too. Uh, and it's an onomatopoeia of what they sound like in Latin. Oh, okay. <laughs> right? Like, really? Tick, yeah. Tick -tick. Oh, Can you tell us they... the genesis of the word onomatopoeia? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a shot. But like words that sound like they, they sound, right? So no. Romans thought cicadas sounded like cicada and named them that. And then we just took the Latin word. Yeah, I yeah. actually would. I, I I think we could have a whole show on onomatopoeias because I really am into them. Um, but they, they re, but it, and so I didn't actually realize that cicada was an onomatopoeia I, it, for for the hard C of of well of classical yeah, Latin. So in oh gosh, let's go back to my high school Latin twenty years ago. Uh, I guess it would be cicada in Latin. Yeah, ki, 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 yeah exactly. Ki, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's kind of yeah, great, though. I love yeah. that. So, just okay, go ahead, Kate. Okay. So, what? So, there are all of these different broods. Mm -hmm. There was a great you gave us sent sent um, Scott and I. I also did my reading. You sent this amazing. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I tried to post trimmer. it. Is there Can a way you? to post it? I'm gonna um, post. I can post it in the chat, but then I also right. was going to post it and I'll post it on the, on the in lieu of fun Twitter page. Um, right. Okay. I forgot about the chat. Right. Okay. Oh, you guys both got it. I'll throw it up too, just to make sure it gets up there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it. it's, re it's really <laughs> great. Actually. This is really great. So one of the main things that it like answered right away is periodical cicadas versus annual cicadas, mm -hmm. which explains why every year, wherever I am in the country, there are always some cicadas that are around. Um, Wait, hold on. Oh, no, what? Sorry, now I'm weirdly.
Sorry, I'm like, now I'm being weird because there is, I'm getting feedback on, oh, I'm getting feedback on Twitter. There it is. Ah, okay, sorry. All of a sudden I was hearing my own voice speaking back to me and it was because I was oh, watching weird. the delayed through another tab oh, on Twitter. Anyway, sorry, it freaked me out. I was like, what's happening? <laughs> um, I'm stuck in a time loop. Uh, the so, so the annual versus the periodical cicadas. So my first question is like, so there's all these different broods. They appear to be in a map kind of like in like areas all over the country. Why do they recognize county boundaries? Uh, it's they like don't. Basically, like, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think that's not, I, I don't think you put that in the most supportive way. Um, I, it's amazing that they do. Uh, how are they able? Yeah. They don't recognize county boundaries. <laughs> but when you're zoomed out to that kind of level, it's like the easiest way to, to show it. Um, that, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a cool story there about how we know about where periodic periodical cicadas are and how hard that is actually. Um, so actually, do you guys mind if I share a screen? I've got the map here. Yeah, of course. No, d yeah, please do. Uh, oh. You should go up to the top. You should be able to go to the top of your screen and you can do share screen. Uh, can perfect. you guys see that? Yeah, perfect. Can you see the yeah. Map? Yep. Yeah, so the cool thing about periodical cicadas, you can see here uh, the map, and it looks like there's, between broods, there's very little overlap, uh, and it just looks like a bunch of jigsaw pieces that we've all fit together across the country. Um, the yellow here is brood 10, so you see it'll be in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania, Jersey, coming down through like a couple spots down here in Georgia, North Carolina. And then a big blob of them out here in Indiana, Ohio, and bits so of like did some did some fucker like get in like his like carriage and like in Pennsylvania and have like a bunch of them and carry them across to like Indiana, like an invasive species or something? Yeah. So the, the how broods work and how we know where they they are is cool. Um, we're really starting to be able to map where they are really precisely in the last 10 to 15 years because of like digital cameras and smartphones and uh oh my god they, like, they're, wait, they're on facebook <laughs> <laughs> they are the gen x uh, <laughs> but before that uh Dean Krisky, who is like the I'm, sorry, how did you, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry just no, it does fine. How is social media? How does that help you <laughs> identify? So it's, it's not social media. Um, there's citizen science websites like uh, iNaturalist where you can upload photos of any living at thing, oh, plants, so cool. animals, Ooh, whatever. So cool. And so, and they come geotagged. So you can see like people are taking photos of these things and where they're uploading every year. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. That, I did not know. That's so cool. Yeah. Before that, it was grad students in cars. So you think about like in the 60s and 70s, they just pay a grad student like here's gas money, go out and drive around and map where you hear these things on the side of the road because you can hear them calling. And that's how we figured like we were making maps 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, they've got records of emergences back to the 1700s based on newspaper records. Like they'd come out and the newspaper would report it somewhere. And people have gone back and mined old newspapers to figure out like when these things are emerging. And because they're every 13 or 17 years, you can predict like, okay, they're here now. Let's go back every 17 years and then check the papers about when they should be coming out. So cool. Um, so like for Brood X, it was like microfiche and typewriters and like maybe <laughs> the rare fax machine. And like now they're coming out and like everything's, we've got like not only like MySpace like has, Come and gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have a MySpace. Like, well, these guys were like in the ground. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I mean, um, I'm, but I'm actually fascinated. Like, why are they, are they different broods only based on timing? Or is there any type of like, can you, have they done DNA like analysis? Does someone like go around and save a bunch of these guys every time they come out in like a box? And like keep them just so you can run tests on them later. That, oh, that's such a good question. Yes. Um, so for a long time we thought broods were like these immutable things that they didn't change. Um, but every now and again you'll get cicadas from a brood that emerge between one and four years earlier. 
So a 17 year cicadas might emerge at 13 years. Uh, that's the most common kind of speed up. Um, oh, and so when you look at the DNA, and this work has only been done in the last three to five years, uh, each brood is actually composed of DNA from multiple sources. So some brood speeding up, some slowing down, and then just kind of combining. Um, so yes, each brood we thought was this like immutable thing that like brood 10 was just brood 10, but it turns out uh, they will, it's just a time thing. If a, if cicadas from a different brood speed up or slow down and come out the same year, they'll mate just fine and like incorporate that DNA into the population. Huh. Cool. Yeah. And um, yeah. Not, not to ask the obvious question, but like why 17 years? Um, we don't know is the short answer. Okay. The longer answer is, so there's two types of periodical cicadas, 13 year and 17 year, both of which are prime numbers. So we think that maybe being a prime number is important. Um, there's a lot of work on how predators track prey. And so like if, where's my finger? There you go. If prey goes up, then you have a corresponding lag a couple years later where the predators go up in response. Like there's more prey, there's more predators. Then the prey population crashes, so the predator population crashes. There's thought that with prime numbers, that eliminates predators from doing that. So it might be that they're escaping predation because the predators can't predict when they will be out. Oh, Maybe. I see. But we have no idea. But also, it's not like the same birds hang out for like 17 years waiting for the cicadas to like show up. Right. Um, so it's when you've got dynamics like that, it's with offspring. If you've got more food because there's more prey, you can have more babies. And then those babies can have more babies until the prey population crashes. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Scott. I thought the most obvious question was how do they know how to count prime numbers? <laughs> um, like, like, I mean, that, I mean, no, no, so seriously, how do they count? I mean, obviously they're not counting 17. They so, are. <laughs> okay. So, Please, I, I, by the way, if there are any cicadas out there, I'm sorry that I, <laughs> I, I, I doubted Actually, you. They're but they're sophisticated. They're like stroking their beard. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, how does it, how does this happen? So we don't know how they can count up to 17, I guess I should say. Um, that they do it <laughs> What's obviously. the big part? But we know how they count. Um, how do they count? So there is nymphs. They're in the ground feeding on sap from tree roots. And we we just figured this out in the last couple of years, uh, which is cool. So if you would have asked me this five years ago, we wouldn't know. But um, where was it? Indianapolis. There was a city out in the Midwest where there was expected to be a brood that would emerge like the following year. But they got a warm spike in January for like two weeks where it was in the 60s. And sap started flowing in the trees and then it cooled down again. And then when it warmed back up, all this a bunch of cicadas in that area emerged a year early. So what we think they're doing is counting when the sap flows change in the tree roots because they're like they're, they're responding to the tree physiology. How they're counting, like how do they get to 17 or 13? Like that we don't know, but we know like how they're figuring out it's a different year. Cool. Uh, 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 I <laughs> extended the invitation on the assumption that you knew the answer to this question. Um, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, <laughs> I know part um, of the answer. Yeah. I, by the way, that was an excellent answer. And I love when people say, I don't know. Um, Cause like, I would so much rather you tell me. But like, you we know, do but that, they, yeah. Wow. Yeah. They try. So they track sap flow. And so somehow that increases their counter. So, so there's a lot, this is getting beyond cicadas, but there is work on how insects count um, that I'm not super familiar with, but there was an experiment where they took some ants in the desert, I think in Africa, and they'll go out to find food and then come back. And they couldn't figure out like how they found the nest uh, until they glued little stilts to their legs. And when they would run back to the nest, they'd overshoot. And they figured out that they're counting their steps going back and then counting their steps coming, going out and then coming back. So if you make their legs longer and they're taking longer steps, they overshoot the nest because they think they're not where they think they are. 
That's Whoa. the best. Thing. That is the best thing I have ever heard. In my, I love I that. I would, I would so watch. I would watch that. It's such would, a cool, <laughs> elegant experiment, too. It is a really. I mean. I don't know how elegant ants and stilts are, but like, <laughs> yeah. the idea of it is elegant. I, I would say <laughs> elegant's not the word that I would use. <laughs> Co comical and um, um, tenacious, yes. Oh, God. Uh, so, yeah. so like insects count somehow, uh, different insects count, uh, but like how they do that in their little tiny brains, I don't think we know. I At least I don't know. I thought it was pheromone trails that like ants put down or something. They so do. that's like not it, but not for long things like that where there's blowing sand and the pheromone trail is not going to like hang out. That's the problem if you're ant in the desert is the sand gets blown around and then you lose the pheromone trail. So you got to come up with something different, which wow. is why they use that species because they don't use pheromones. Yeah, that's kind of amazing. Um, yeah, wow. this is like an incredible, like I feel like dorky, like dorky <laughs> me is like, um, so uh wouldn't a really easy way to test your experiment be to like put a bunch of the nymphs on some some buried like tree sap things and do something artificial and have like it pump sap like 16 17 times and then just like see if you can get them to come out like in like three months you could yeah the, thing? the problem with that is they probably wouldn't grow fast enough Ooh. But wouldn't they grow based on the tree sap that they were like getting? No, um, if they don't, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to like fight the no, hypothetical here. No, because it does. Tree sap doesn't have a lot of nutrients in it. Oh. It's really, it's really poor. It's high in carbohydrates and poor in fats um, and protein. <laughs> so you got to you got to eat a lot of it to get that protein. Um, and so it just it take part of so annual cicadas like we see every year, usually have a three to four li year life cycle underground because it takes three to four years for them to go from babies to adults. It just takes a long time when you're feeding on sap because it, it is not good as a food source. How, uh, I, w so what about cicadas themselves? Have you ever eaten a cicada? I have not. I've never, I've been near a couple periodical cicada emergences, but never seen one. I'm, I'm, I'm super pumped for this one because it's so close. Like we can drive an hour or two and go see it this year. Um, so we'll probably take our kids and go down and do that because I I've never experienced it and I am very very excited to. Um, yeah. But no, I haven't eaten them because I just never. Okay. I've I haven't had bucket loads of them laying around. Do people eat them? People do eat them. And um, are they supposed to be good? If you cook them in the right way, they're supposed to be all right. Um, I mean, <laughs> you cook them in the right way, they're supposed to be all right. Okay. Yeah, know, <laughs> there's a lot of exoskeleton there, which is crunchy and not digestible. But if you think about like having a crawfish boil or eating a lobster, like you don't eat the the exoskeleton of those either. You eat the meat inside. Um, so if you can get enough cicadas and get enough of that cicada meat. Uh, you could probably make a meal of it. Like there's recipes for putting them on pizza and doing all kinds of other stuff with them. Uh, and no, thank you. I, yeah. Um, if you, you just think <laughs> of it, I'm like flying crawfish. We're going to go have a crawfish boil in Louisiana. And which I, I went to one in, when I was in Arkansas and it's so good. Uh, yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, okay. So I took this Scott loves me, thinks it's cool if I, it would be cool if I showed this. So I showed you that picture of the swallowtail butterfly. Uh, let me see if I can get it to play in QuickTime Player. I might not because it's going to be a jerk. Um, it's a uh, really, I mean, it's really, it's can you, can you like this? Nova quality. No, you can't. No, no. Um, oh, well. That was, that's it. I can't play it. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> I know. I'm going to try yeah. to, but like I, so I found, basically I gathered a bunch of wild fennel and like a bunch of things one fall and I put it in a big bouquet and I brought it home and I like put it on my, and my, um, like my coffee table at home. And like a couple of days later, I was like cleaning up and there was just like all of these perfectly round droppings all over like the coffee table. And I like looked into the bouquet and there were like 
just like six giant fat swallowtail caterpillars that had hatched on that were like on the fennel, um, which is like what they eat, mm -hmm. and uh, and were and were and so I decided to keep them and have them form cocoons and then like watch them um, hatch into butterflies. And it was super cool. And I filmed this video that is refusing to show itself. But ah. hold on. Let me see if I can, um, let's see if I can do it through something else. Um, did you, but, did you um, what did you use to film it? You, you, it was just my iPhone. Go um, figure. Yeah, it was really crazy. Um, but anyways, let's start. So Richard has a great question. We're gonna bring in some guests to ask you some questions and I will try okay. to make this work in the meantime. Um, is Richard there? Richard, you're a black rectangle. Oh, there you are. Hi. I'm, I'm no longer a black rectangle. Hi, nice to see you. Hello. How are Excellent you? Excellent question. Hi, Go ahead. So um, since etymologists, entomologists, <laughs> etymologists might apply too. So uh, since they have such a tiny window every 17 years in which to gather data on the activities of these cicadas when they're above ground, um, what are some of the most significant problems that researchers will be rushing to study this year? And is there anything distinctive about brood 10 that uh, they'd be looking at? Yeah, so there, Every year there's some periodic, well, not every year, but almost every year, there's some periodical cicada brood emerging somewhere. Um, sometimes they're really small, maybe just a couple counties in one state, but somewhere, someplace, there is some coming out in most years. Uh, but the big problem was trying to, you know, pre-i or pre-smartphones that you could take lots of photos with and put to the internet was trying to figure out even just where they were, where the limits were. Um, brood 10 is, uh, interesting because it's the biggest emergence. So it's across something like 15 or 13 states. Uh, it's the biggest emergence of periodical cicadas in the country at any point when they are emerging. Uh, so that, that's the big reason people are excited about it this year. You don't, people don't get excited when it's just a couple counties over in the middle of Tennessee. Um, but so many people are going to be inundated with cicadas this year that it's, it makes a splash. Um, as far as what they're rushing to investigate, um, a lot, I get getting back to the, the comment about did people put cicadas in boxes? A lot of the research in the last couple of years has been using DNA of specimens that were collected. Um, in doing things like figuring out that the broods are just based on time, like when they emerge and not these immutable things where all the brood, cicadas of a brood always come out. Um, a lot of it's been using specimens that were in natural history collections like the Smithsonian or the, the collection here at Penn State. Um, most land grant universities have an insect collection. So a lot of the research recently has been using those specimens. Um, but as so, far so as you have an so, do, you, do you have an, and you actively acquire insects as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll add some to the collection this year. We'll go down and, and get some. Oh, um, cool. Did that answer your question? I'm not. I don't know. I don't know if people are go are like rushing to the area this year to go study them. I don't. I don't do cicada research. Um, some people do, but I'm not sure what exactly they're doing. Um, there is. Uh, what's it called? There's an app that is out there that I think I have it downloaded. Let me see if C I can find Cicada it. Safari. Yes, Cicada Safari. Um, oh my it's gosh, very what is bug that? It's very buggy. Yeah. Oh, oh is it? It's an app that they're asking you to take photos and get audio of cicadas so they can map exactly where they're emerging this year and how many of them there are. Um, because they, they, I think they can get how dense the population is based on like how loud it is. There's just a couple cicadas calling. It's not very loud. If you've got tens of thousands, then it's deafening. Um, and it's part of this, this new trend of like getting finer and finer and finer data of where these things are coming out every, every time. Um, and part of that is because uh, periodical cicadas are impacted by things like urbanization in agriculture in like downtown <laughs> Pittsburgh, you won't get any of them uh, because it's just so developed they can't survive. And, and in areas with 
high agricultural input. If you're out there tilling the soil all the time or cutting all the trees down that they like to feed on, you can, you can kill them all off. Um, and so we're trying to get long-term data now with like, where are they exactly? And then where are they going to be in 17 years and what's changed in the meantime to kill them off or make more of them or something. Uh, huh. So you yeah. can kill them when you dig deep enough? If you, if you go into a forest over a large area, like say you've got a big swath of forest and you convert it all to corn, uh, you'll kill them all off because there's just no more trees to feed on. Oh, if you do that over a big enough area, like multiple counties, they can they can go extinct locally. Um, 17 year cicadas used to emerge in northern Indiana regularly. And if you go there now, it's all corn and soybeans and they're just not there like at at all. Um, huh. I had no idea. Yeah. I thought so, that like I thought that they must did something special or went so deep that like somehow they could come back no matter what. No, if you do, if you disturb an area enough, you can kill all of them off. Um, like we have in Indiana with corn and soybeans. Crazy. Um, well, thank you, Richard. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Andrew McCur McCurdy has another question. I'm, he promises this is a real thing. Okay. So, Andrew, what is this thing? I haven't heard of this thing. So I hadn't heard of it until a few hours ago when I uh, quickly heard he was going to be on the show and I looked up as much as I could about cicadas. And apparently there's a fungus that's a butt munching fungus called massaspora. Mm -hmm. Butt munching, uh, a butt munching fungus. I just wanted to say butt munching that's in a serious I, way. <laughs> so did I. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what impact will it have on brood X uh, and how much of an impact? Sure. So I guess to answer the immediate question is I don't know how, what the impact will be on brood X or brood 10. So it's so hard not to say brood X. Everybody does. Right? It does sound kind of badass. Yeah. yeah. I don't I don't know what the impact will be or how widespread it will be. Um, there was a paper that came out in 2018. Uh, this fungus is really cool. There's a lot of insect attacking fungi out there. Uh, maybe you've heard of zombie ants where the fungus attacks the ants and makes them like climb up and grab onto a plant so this fungal spores can blow away. Um the big reason that the fungus that attacks these cicadas got, uh, got I guess, a lot of press is one of the chemicals it makes is psilocybin, which is in magic mushrooms. So a lot of like the press things were like, you know, psychedelic fungus in cicada butts. Um, wow. That just like that headline just writes itself. <laughs> right? I mean, no, I was just going to say, I, 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 I'll read that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's it's a good I mean, way to get a lot of attention, um, but it's a really cool it, fungus. It makes you don't have to make the case for why it's a really cool fungus. It's kind of <laughs> <laughs> it's so, kind of on its on its surface. Well, yeah. even beyond the psychedelic uh, chemical, it also makes oh gosh, it's another chemical that makes you hyperactive and I'm blanking on what kind of chemical it is. But so the cicadas, even now they're being killed are like, they, they just are super active compared to normal cicadas. And then when cicadas mate, the males call and the females kind of land next to them and flick their wings is like uh, talking to the male, telling him like, Hey, I like your song. Let's get busy. Um, the, the fungus turns the males and makes them do that wing flick. And so other males come in thinking they're going to get lucky. And when the wings flick, they throw fungal spores onto the males that are coming in to mate. And then those males get infected. And so it's making males do the female call in order to infect more males. Wow. <laughs> That's so yeah. weird. Right? They, like, they think they might be, the, the cadas might be overthinking this, I think. Uh, <laughs> either, either that or we're really underthinking it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool from a bunch of different angles. Um, that's like yeah. so. That is. So I mean, that's a, that is a. It, it, that is such a fun fact. Yeah. But. Yeah. yeah. But I don't. How it's going to affect Brood Ten? I don't. I don't. I don't know. But I'm not sure anybody knows. Uh, They'll be Laura. out there. Hi. So nice to see you. Hello. Uh, um, 
go ahead. So you, I don't know if you might have partially answered this question already when you were talking about the habitat change in Indiana. Do you think that that could have anything to do with the fact that the Long Island population of brood 10 might have gone extinct? At least that's what I'm reading, but I didn't see anything that really talked about reasons why. Sure. So there, there is a, uh, I guess to back up just a smidge, there is a small population on Long Island that seems to be disconnected from the rest of brood 10. Um, I'm not sure of the genetics. It might just be some that were on there that, that sped up from a different year and became established. But uh, if you think about Long Island, it's super developed. Um, and in a lot of places in North Eastern Pennsylvania, uh, periodical cicadas have been in decline. There are less and less every year because of probably development. Um, I'm not super familiar with what's going on on Long Island, but if they were declining and went extinct, like the brood 10 population went extinct, I wouldn't be surprised given the amount of, of development on Long Island. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have Robert Moses to thank for that. Thank you, Robert Moses. <laughs> so I, yeah, I don't know precisely, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if they, they are going out. Are, are you bracing yourself for like, like as the equivalent of Christmas for the post office? Like when the cicadas first come out, brood 10 comes out in parts of Pennsylvania and you, they, people just keep on shipping like <laughs> brood 10 to you. And it's just going to be just like, these envelopes and envelopes of brood 10 and you're going to have to respond to them. Uh, honestly, probably not. Um, oh, really? No, because they, they come out. It's such an event when they come out. Um, I think I've done 10 interviews for local news stations at this point and like I newspapers. See. So a lot of people are getting the word out. Like they're coming. This is what they are. This is what they do. This is where they are. Um, I see. So you'd yeah. have to be really out, like complete. You'd have to be so off the grid that you heard nothing about it. Mm -hmm. You clued in enough to know that there is this lab at Penn you'd State. You'd have to be buried underground for seventeen years. <laughs> 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 How did I? Yeah, you were like so one. close, Scott. I, 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 you, know, <laughs> you were just setting you know, that, me up. I, I, no, no, but bra brava. Yeah. <laughs> I have gotten a couple emails about, so the cicadas will, will come up from the ground in April and then hang out for about a month while they wait for the soils to warm up. Um, they use soil temperature to time their emergence, so they all come out on one, on one night or within a couple days of each other. But they'll burrow up and make, like, the tunnel entrance and just kind of wait until the, in, in about a month before they come out. So I've had two or three inquiries, like, why are all these holes in my yard all of a sudden? Uh, and it's the nymphs that are going to be coming out in your yard in three to four weeks uh, that people don't know that are have been living underground for 17 years. It's pretty, wow. so that's, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, and that it's makes sense. Really like, wild. Holes in their yard, they don't know what that is. But when the adults come out, I bet most people, most places will know what they are. Yeah. So I think I got the thing to work. Let me see if I can do this. Yeah. Um, see Is it permissible as a member, of, as a host to like, if I want to get uh, something yeah. like yeah. a beer? No, go. I just, I just ran to the bathroom. <laughs> like, oh, okay. And I don't have to do anything. No, you don't have to do anything. Like just, yeah. I'll be, I'll um, be right back. I can yeah. still hear. Yep. Um, so, uh, Scott's already seen this, but this is, can you see this? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is a video that I took a couple years ago <clears throat> of, as time lapsed of a swallowtail um, caterpillar. And you'll see it just hung itself from that, like it's anchored itself and then hung mm -hmm. itself from that small piece of, of silk. And this is over, I think like 12 hours I shot this. Um, is it like a, a shot every couple seconds or? Uh, no, it was just a time lapse. I left the camera okay. set up for like, so. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So that was super cool. And then 
Um, so I did that one, and then I did. Hold on, let's see if I can play. It's gonna. I have to stop and play this from the beginning. Um, uh, hold on. Um, so there was that one, and then I also did the. Uh, when it uh, when it emerged, so oh, cool. that is this is it emerging yeah. and unfurling its unfurling its and How drying beautiful. its rings. Yeah, it was such a it turned into this was shot in the bathroom because by the time the butterfly was ready to emerge, my partner who we live in a small studio apartment was like, you cannot have a light oh. next to our bed on like, <laughs> for ten hours shooting overnight this like butterfly emerging from a thing, you go set it up in the bathroom. So this isn't our sink, uh, but it came out <laughs> great, I thought. <laughs> yep. yeah, really nice. Yeah. Really fantastic. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, that's, a, that's spectacular. So there's, so now I was gonna ask, what is your favorite type of bug? Type of bug, you can name a specific bug, but I'm also curious what your type of favorite oh, type man, of bug this is. This is so hard every time somebody asks me. Let me see if I can find a photo and I'll share real, real quick. Um, my favorite, I think, are scorpion flies. Whoa. And, oh, yeah, here's a here's a photo. Whoa. Whoa. They sound uh, really cool. Yeah. Where is their screen share? Uh, entire screen. Uh, so there we go. Can you see that? Whoa. That's yeah. a fly? No. Uh, it's it's not a fly. The flies? Wow, thanks for the fucking nightmares, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're really cool. So they feed on dead insects. They don't bite or anything. Um, this is a male, and they have these big genital claspers uh, uh -huh. that they use for mating. They they kind of look like a scorpion tail, so they're called scorpion flies, but they can't sting or pinch or anything. They're just used for oh. mating. Okay. Um, so a harmless penis is what you're saying. But it's like <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, the reason. Uh, oh, oh gosh, how do I? There we go. There go. The reason that that clasper is so big is that the females mm, aren't interest. Uh, I don't know if interested is, like is the word, but um, the the males uh, just grab them and mate with them, so they have to have big, big claspers to do that with. Got it. So that's where are those, and so I know not to sure. go there. Everywhere. Oh, great! Uh, here being like <laughs> literally everywhere. They're across the. They're across the U.S. Uh, awesome. They're they're often found in what like moist woodlands on tops of plants, so you'll see them flitting around. Why are they your favorite? Because nobody's. They look cool? Yeah, because they look cool, and I like things that aren't studied very much. Um, they feed on dead insects, and they don't do anything like. They don't bite people. They don't harm agriculture. There's no reason to study them besides they're neat. Uh, and I like things that are understudied. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Susan, the yeah, uh, hey. yours. Thanks. Um, Michael, I live up in Northeast Georgia, and I haven't been here long enough to know if I'm going to have the brood 11 minus 1. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a way to do it. You know, equals 10. I mean, it's 10. It's not X. It's 11 minus 1. So, um, I'm, so I'm, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say, so I'm uh, in the woods and uh, it's like, tw uh, oh, I think the elevation is, and now I can't remember, but it's pretty high. Might be 2,000 feet. Anyway, um, so I'm walking outside on the porch one day, and, and there's this uh, bench that's out there, and it has a cushion on it, and there's this incredible spider, and it's called a um, orb. giant lichen, lichen oh, orb yeah, yeah. weaver spider. And I was just like, holy shit, this is the coolest thing I have ever seen. So he appeared from, he, she appeared from out of nowhere. You know, it sat there. I brought up my uh, phone and I took pictures and then I went back inside and I came out just a little bit later and I was like, the spider was gone. I have never seen one again. 
I what did um, you say, ha- Susan? I'm sitting there did thinking, you insult their mother? Oh, I, <laughs> I, I just I just wish. I mean, I just wish. First of all, I knew more about them, and I found out about them on the internet. But it's like, shouldn't they be here? And ha- and shouldn't I be able to see it again? And how do they get so beautiful? I mean, insects. I mean, it's just a general question. Sure. So to back up to the periodicals, Kate, a bit, um, looking at the map here, it, I guess it depends on where exactly you are in northern Georgia, in northeast Georgia. They are, this USDA map that they put out uh, shows them in some counties, like three or four in northern Georgia, northeastern Georgia. So maybe um, they're there, at least in some places, maybe not very many of them, but they should be there. Um With the lichen orb weavers, uh, they are big and pretty. I don't uh, know a whole lot about them. I've gotten them as idea requests maybe once or twice. Um, what, but. What, what's the what, what's the um, specimen that you get asked to ID the most? The things that I get the most are home pests because people, especially during the pandemic, are in their homes and seeing the bugs that they maybe don't usually see. Uh, the thing that I get the most are probably drugstore beetles. So they're they're stored product pests. They'll eat on any kind of dried food matter. Um, anything in your pantry, flour, rice, uh, cereals, any kind of dried food. Why are they called drugstore? Yeah. So, was it so drugstore pests? Drugstore beetle. Uh, because because drugstore beetle sorry. If you, I've never heard of that. Yeah, so if you picture like a drugstore at the turn of the 1900s, where they've got just like bottles of dried herbs and dried drugs and stuff. They like would an get apothecary. Into that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They would get into that stuff. Huh. Um, oh, oh, so it's an, oh, oh, it's an old name that they, and the thing about drugstore beetles is they can eat just about anything. They've been recorded to eat through lead plating. Uh, they can eat strychnine and other <laughs> chemicals that would normally like they'll feed on um bait for cockroaches that will is supposed to kill cockroaches but they feed on it just fine uh i don't like <laughs> these guys already they're, yeah, I know. They're, they're, this they're by the way is it is what susan was describing yeah, they're, that is they're a they're giant like an oh my god that, that's Isn't gorgeous. That gorgeous yeah it yeah looks like jewelry it's like, really yeah, it looks like a beautiful brooch yeah it does um, it really does yeah. why the spider disappeared i don't know they when they're big like that, and especially at the center of the web, birds like to fly by and like pick them out of the web. Oh, um, yeah. So there's a good, a good chance it just got predated. Yeah. Um, but yeah, drugstore well, beetles. Well, don't are cool. tell Susan that her spider got predated. The spider went to a farm <laughs> somewhere. And it's <laughs> <fine>. <laughs> I don't need to ruin. It's living under your porch. It just didn't like you very much because it heard the <laughs> things you were saying about its mother. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, Chris. Oh, you're you muted. I'm you're unmuting muted. you. Sorry. Oh, can Chris. you hear me today? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I have sound. Good. Hooray! Technology works for once. All right. So, my question is: as a Pennsylvanian in southeastern Pennsylvania, we're about to start exporting something else that we really don't want to: the spotted lantern yep. fly. What do you know about what they're doing to get rid of them? I read somewhere that in Berks County they were playing with funguses that uh, are that are capable of uh, knocking them off. Is that going to get spread out, or is that still research in progress? Sure. I don't know if you made this image, but I'm going to share it while you talk. Um, <laughs> but it is, um, but it is, it's from Penn State. Um, I'm going to see you later, Chris. So I'm going to close you so I can fit it on the screen. Um, but this is the spotted lanternfly, who are those who are unaware, was like a huge predator in um, Pennsylvania. This. Uh, They're gorgeous. It's actually quite beautiful. Whoa. Um, yeah, it's like really wow. beautiful, but they eat crops like crazy Ooh. and destroy gardens. Yeah. Um, so there. Yeah. Th- we could do an entire hour on spotted lanternfly. Um, there was one. They, they feed on a wide variety of things, but there was one grape vineyard. Uh, where they're found, uh, what, in 2018, 55 acres of grapes got zero yield because the, the feeding was so heavy. 
So imagine having a vineyard and not producing a single grape on 55 acres because these things are just sucking them dry. Um, they also feed on apples and a bunch of trees that trees are usually pretty good at handling insect feeding. Um, uh, I'll see if I can find it. Real they, I mean, they just Maybe like later. they fed on like gardens. Like they just like killed all of my like my friends like kind of vegetable gardens yeah, that they, were in Philly and lot. outside of Philly last last year. And they're really beautiful, but they they are like super. Um, they're super invasive. They look like they look like flies. Like like they almost look so beautiful. Like they look like something you'd like when I say flies. They look like uh, like fly a, you would make. Yeah, it's like fly yeah, for, for, for fly fishing, right? Yeah. I mean, are are they poisonous? Because they they, they seem extraordinarily um, colorful, and I thought that was they, like the they're dis humber. they're not poisonous, but they are distasteful to birds. So there's not a whole lot of things that eat them. Um, oh, I see. I'm gonna we uh, let me do a share screen. I've got a video and a PowerPoint that hopefully. Yeah, works. I bet this is all you've been talking about for a while. I've, uh, can you see this? Yeah. Right. Yes, we can actually. So this is a heavily infested tree with spotted butterflies. <gasps> oh my goodness. <laughs> Jesus. Just Crazy. to give you an idea of how bad this is, where they're found. Oh. Um, most Holy of the time. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's most like of the time. Cool. Yeah, most trees can handle a lot of insect feeding, but when you when a, even a big tree gets fed on like that for multiple years in a row, it might kill it. Uh, no so kidding. It's, yeah, it's a <laughs> they're a big deal. Um, but so for a long time, uh, not a long time. They've only yeah. been here for like seven or eight years. For the for most of that time, we've tried to contain them to just a couple counties they were in in southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, last year, they finally kind of broke quarantine. And they cut this path straight across Unlike Pennsylvania. The rest of us. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, so what happens is they they popped out along a rail line. It looks like they got on a train. And when the train went across Pennsylvania, they just jumped off all over the place. And now they have broken the containment that we had for like seven or eight years. Some and straight up zebra muscle shit. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> um <laughs> what God? So <laughs> <laughs> can we, I, can, I, I, I feel like I need to get back to eating insects. Have you, no. ever, eaten, <laughs> have you ever eaten any insects? Have I eaten insects? Uh, yes. I've eaten, I've eaten grasshoppers and mealworms and crickets. Yeah, I think that I, might I, be it. Can you report? Like what your what, what yeah. you felt about them because this this gross. would be much easier to handle <laughs> if I knew that they were tasty or something. My brother was really into this. He was at the Duke School of Environment and he was like super into like insects as food and certifying yeah. them as like like for food certifiable, which is really funny when you figure out that like when you figure that like a lot of food safety is about not having insects in it. <laughs> like <they're pretty laughs> right, exactly like, right. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. This insect has not been touched by any corn chip or something. Yeah. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> uh, yeah. Crickets are gross. I've never liked anything that's had crickets in it. Uh, but mealworms are okay. They taste like whatever you fry them up in. So if you toss some butter and garlic in, they taste like butter and garlic. If you toss any kind of seasoning and they just pick up the flavor of that and then add uh, whatever you're cooking, like tossing them into a little bit of crunch. But what, when you say crickets are gross, like why? Just, Cause they don't they taste like hate. anything. They taste like dirt. They taste. I don't know. It's, it's a cricket flavor. I don't know how to describe it, but I do not yeah, find it to be a pleasant not, flavor. Um, they, is just, it bitter? No, they're not bitter. They're just, it's, I'm, I'm trying to imagine. It's like, Crickety. I don't know, like a musty, I guess. I don't okay. like <laughs> like eating I don't enjoy your grandma. It. <laughs> but mealworms are okay. And mealworms there was one other good. thing you said that you had eaten. Have you ever eaten ants? I have not. Oh, the grasshoppers. That's right. I've I'm had sorry. Grasshoppers. And what do you think of them? Uh, they're all right. They're, there's a lot of there's a lot of exoskeleton <laughs> in all of them. Um, people do eat ants. Uh, it's a delicacy, even in. Uh, where was it? France. Um, they get honeypot ants, which are these ants that, um, if you're not familiar, they uh, get fed and fed and fed. And so the, the abdomen gets bigger and bigger and bigger. 
uh, and then they they feed their nest mates through the year on that. But they're real sweet. So if you plop one of those like on top of a dessert, it's a delicacy. Weird. Cool. <laughs> cool. Weird. Just, cool different. and weird. It's different. different. <laughs> yes. Henry, you get the final question. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you very much. So, uh, is anything known about the relationship between the uh, are the, are the cicadas beneficial for the trees, or is it a, just a one-way uh, street? Sure. Um, so I guess that gets more at the question of are cicadas pests? And the the answer is mostly not. Um, as far as we can tell, even though they're underground feeding on trees for 17 years and there's a lot of them, um, because to have thousands or millions of cicadas emerge in an area, you have to have all of those underground feeding on trees. They don't, the feeding from the nymphs underground doesn't seem to affect trees at all. Um, there's no detrimental effect. Uh, the trees don't gain anything, but they don't seem to lose anything. The problem that you can have is female cicadas cut a small slit into a tree twig or a branch to lay I their eggs it. in. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the eggs hatch and then they kind of plop to the ground and dig down. Um, when you've got tens of thousands or millions of cicadas in, air, in an area and they all lay eggs in the same tree, that can kill branches because they're just doing so much damage. Big healthy trees are usually fine. Like they can, they might be aesthetically unpleasing because they've got dead leaves in the thing, but they'll be, they'll recover and bounce back with no problem. The big problem is if you've got a tree that is small, like five to 10 feet and recently transplanted. So you rip it out of the ground, one place, you plop it into the ground somewhere else and it's already stressed because you planted it. Uh, if that tree gets ovaposited on or laid eggs on a lot by the cicadas, they can do enough damage to that tree because it's already stressed. It's already not doing well uh, that they can kill it outright. Um, so our big advice, and that's the, really the only damage they do. Um, nursery owners, people that own tree nurseries have to be concerned because they often have lots of trees that are in the size range cicadas like. But for homeowners, that's that's about it. So we suggest that either don't plant trees uh, just avoid it altogether because we know when these things are coming. They're coming this year. Just uh, wait a year. Just wait, wait a year. Or, <laughs> or even plant in the fall. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're fine when they're gone. <laughs> yeah, pure yeah, This, this is like, like this is the height of impatience. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Just don't like, do it right now. You can't wait <laughs> a couple of months to plant the tree that's going to be there for like maybe 100 years. Yeah. Because you have. <laughs> Um, if you do plant it, you can just put netting over your tree. Just keep the cicadas away from it. Um, and there's a real good, I, I found a great image to do that with. Um, I'm going to share one last time in this fact sheet that I wrote. Uh, entire screen. So we're going to go over and here's an image of some, of some trees that have been netted. Uh, covered in bugs for a second until I realized that they were covered in. Oh, and, they're covered in right. netting. You That's just, fine. Yeah, totally. Yeah, okay. Throw the netting over them. Let cool. it sit there like that for four to six weeks till the cicadas go away. And then and take the netting good. off. And you're cool. good. Just keep, just keep them away. This has been such an incredible hour. Scott. Fan fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. I mean, I, I had very high hopes, but... This like, has exceeded expectations. Oh, good. Way, I love doing way this kind exceed. of thing, so... Um, uh, it, you're really great at it. Thank you. What, what <laughs> is, Michael, yeah. you say you like comic books in your Twitter bio. I do. I have a whole host oh my of goodness. My Encyclopedia of Mushrooms, but those are like all my comic book anthologies. Nice. Um, but someone asked and didn't want to be brought on screen. Someone asked what your favorite comic book insect was. Oh gosh, my favorite comic book insect. I don't think... I don't think I have a favorite comic book insect. No, no, fuck that. The right answer is the tick. It's obviously the tick. Oh, it can't be the beetle. <laughs> it's so good. What? I've not read the tick. I've heard it's very good. You should watch it. You should you should read I've, it, but you should also watch it. It's a uh, it's uh, I, it was on Amazon and it's so good. It's like it? it's actually Scott. You would like it too. Have you watched it? No, no, I have not. Oh, I awesome. I saw the original animated cartoon when I was a child. 
Uh, but it's been it's been quite a while. I enjoyed it when I was a kid. I don't know how it's held up. Yeah. Well, Sorry. thank you so much for coming on. This has been awesome. And uh, if Ben was here, he would say, Michael, you're a great American. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. Uh, you sound like you might even be Canadian. I have no idea, but like, I, you're so not I, Canadian? No, I grew up outside of Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. So, oh, you even got to come back to Pennsylvania. Dude, How perfect is that? My family's like two hours away. It's, wow. it's just close enough that they come visit sometimes, but just far away enough that they don't pop over for dinner unannounced. Yeah, exactly. It's the, it's the dream. Uh, uh, <laughs> we will be back two hours and 54 minutes from now. Ben will be fully vaccinated and fully inoculated like having wait, waited his 10 day period and he will be at an outdoor cafe. And uh, and we will just be shooting the shit. And I think John Bordeaux and a bunch of the, the Greek chorus is going to show up and be uh, to hang out with Ben in DC um, at a cafe. And that will be 22 hours and 53 minutes from now. And until then, Scott. We're not allowed to have fun anymore. <laughs> but in the place of fun, we get to have incredibly awesome public education from experts. Thank yeah. you so much. This was so great. Thank you so much, Michael. This is amazing. Yeah. See you guys Thanks for having me. This is a blast. Yeah. Come Thank back you. anytime. Th you yes, should really anytime. actually come back anytime because we like are <laughs> weird people and we like bugs and weird stuff. So like, it would be really fun. <laughs> I am here whenever you need me. So, okay. okay. Bye-bye.